Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, you'll learn about a book written in 1950 called The Authoritarian Personality. The book has had a great deal of influence on helping to brainwash the American people against men of courage and convictions. You'll also learn about the connection between this book and how liberals are using it to paint the followers of Donald Trump's policies. This is part two of our series, Brainwashed America. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. WVW-TV presents the Worldview Weekend Hour with Brandon House. Whether the topic is law, science, government, economics, history, family, social issues, education, or theology, Brennan brings the issues of today into clear focus through the lens of a biblical worldview. And now, here is your host, Brennan House. Good evening and welcome to the Worldview Weekend Hour and part two in our series on Brainwashed America. Let's do a quick review tonight before we get into that 1950 book, Authoritarian Personality. And how that book from 1950, written by some of the faculty of the Frankfurt School, is very applicable to the topics of today, such as toxic masculinity, the war on the American male, and what is the connection between this 1950 book, written by some of the faculty of the cultural Marxist Frankfurt School, and the followers of Donald Trump, or at least those who support some of his policies, such as his building the wall for national security, his policy on immigrants from terrorist nations, jihadist nations, uh, his position on make America great again, his position on the economy. What does all of those policies have to do with a book written in 1950? You'll learn tonight about the connection between authoritarian personality, the book from 1950, and the war on the masculine male leader of today. Let's just do a quick review. What is the definition of brainwashing? Quick review, the definition of brainwashing. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines brainwashing as a forcible indoctrination to induce someone to give up basic political, social, or religious beliefs and attitudes and to accept contrasting regimented ideas. It's also about persuasion by propaganda or salesmanship. Again, notice we're talking about basic political, social, or religious beliefs and attitudes. It's the attempt to change someone's attitudes, values, feelings, and beliefs. And I believe the three institutions that are being used most effectively for this are education, media, and religion. And we'll get into that in subsequent programs. But those are your three power centers that have been highly targeted for the information operation, the brainwashing campaign, the uh, fake news, psychological warfare, uh, propaganda war, uh, mind control, re-education, political correctness, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same thing. The goal to change someone's attitudes, values, feelings, and emotions and involving their political convictions, their beliefs about public policy, as we'll see tonight. The Psychological Dictionary defines brainwashing as a method that manipulates and modifies a person's emotions, attitudes, and beliefs. It utilizes intensely persuasive, even coercive tactics in order to enforce these changes. Well, my friends, here's the cover of a book that I've referenced many times over the years called Through the Eyes of the Enemy. It was written, as the subtitle says, by Russia's highest ranking military defector. And what did Stan, uh, Stan Islev Linov reveal? He revealed that brainwashing is really about, well, what we've been saying, changing someone's attitudes, values, feelings, and beliefs, and is being done inside America by America's enemies, including, at the time, the former Soviet Union. Here's what he wrote in his book. Remember, he's the highest ranking officer to defect from the USSR to the U.S. And he wrote in this book, quote, what, be, what will be a great surprise to the American people is that the GRU, that would be the military intelligence division of the KGB, the GRU and the KGB had a larger budget for anti-war propaganda in the United States than it did for economic and military support for the Vietnamese. The anti-war propaganda cost the GRU more than $1 billion, 
But as history shows, it was a hugely successful campaign and well worth the cost. The anti-war sentiment created an incredible momentum that greatly weakened the U.S. military. Well, my friends, there you go. If you don't think that it's possible for outsiders to come into America and use our powerful institutions of education and religion and media to change the attitudes, values, feelings, and beliefs of Americans, to change their public policy positions, then you don't understand history. Because as this highest ranking ever military intelligence official says in his book, Through the Eyes of the Enemy, the former USSR, and what was the USSR at the time, spent over a billion dollars in America influencing those three institutions, really, education, media, and religion. And we'll get into that more in subsequent programs, as I said. John Stormer, in his book, None Dare Call It Treason, documents that in 1954, Senator William Jenner told the story of a factory in Nazi Germany that made baby carriage parts, which, when assembled, became a machine gun. Quote, Someone, somewhere, conceived the brilliant strategy of revolution by assembly line. The pattern for total revolution was divided into separate parts, each of them as innocent, safe, and familiar looking as possible. But when the parts of a design are carefully cut to exact size to fit e uh, other parts with a per perfect fit in the final assembly, the parts must be made according to a blueprint drawn up in exact detail. The men who make the blueprints know exactly what the final product is to be. This assembly line revolution is like a time bomb. It is ready to go off, but it is not going to be set off until the time is ripe, until a switch is pulled. The switch is not to be pulled until the American people are conditioned, are convinced that resistance is hopeless, end quote. Notice, again, the various parts of this machine have been built, and they don't look all that dangerous as individual parts. In fact, they may look very benign and harmless, but when assembled, uh, these various parts could be a killing machine. My friends, I believe what I'm about to show you are the various parts that have been assembled here in America. They've been built individually and are now being assembled together collectively to create national suicide for America. Various parts have been created that when assembled are a killing machine for our national sovereignty, our culture, our economy, our way of life. Notice again that this senator says that the goal is to condition, that the switch will not be pulled until the American people are conditioned. A big part of brainwashing is softening people up. And another way of saying that is people have to be conditioned like a frog. If the old saying and the old story of a frog, you know, that's dropped into a boiling uh, or into cool water and then it's slowly heated up until he's boiled alive, but he's become conditioned to the water and doesn't realize that he's being boiled alive. The American people have been conditioned. And again, another word for that is softened up. And there are many things going on in America right now to soften up the American people to lose their liberty and freedoms and to not react when that occurs. Many of you tonight can probably think of such scenarios that have been carried out the last few years in America that you have not liked, that inside your very soul you knew was not right, but you were in the minority and you were hesitant to say anything lest you be considered extreme. Certain things like being groped every time you go to get on an airplane, you, you know something's not right with them groping senior citizens, groping little old ladies, while the people that are wearing the uh, hijaz and hijads and uh, Islamic wear seem to get the politically correct treatment. Why is that? If this is about trying to stop our planes from being hijacked by Islamists, why does it seem that political correctness comes into play and people that are wearing Islamic wardrobes seem to get less treatment than the little old lady in a wheelchair. Or as I saw the other day, someone who uh, 
had multiple limbs amputated was getting an intrusive pat down from the TSA. What is this really all about? It's certainly not about national security, not when the back end of our airports are not secured and Islamists are loading and unloading the planes and have access to the planes and contractors. What is all this about? It's window dressing on the front. And I believe largely what it is, is conditioning or softening up the American people to see what will they tolerate? Will they go along with intrusion? Intrusion into their lives, their privacy, and even their personal dignity. And I believe we could sit here tonight and we could talk about many things that are going on in America to condition the American people, to soften them up, to see how much will the American people take. But that's exactly what's been going on. A softening up, a conditioning of the American people. And while we are being softened up, the various parts of this killing machine have been created. And now I believe they're being assembled together. Let me share with you what I believe are the various parts of this machine. Again, so many of my bullet points are original research from hours of research and study. And then I write down and take a, uh, a, a, my blank a journal, blank sheets from my journal, and then I write down or outline the thoughts I have. And so you could do this yourself as you study, and you might come up with different points. You might come up with better points than I have. But let me share with you what I believe are various uh, pieces that have been uh, uh, created, various parts that have been manufactured, and when assembled, will create a killing machine, the parts of a national killing machine when assembled. And in a subsequent program, we'll go into these in greater detail and we'll see how they actually build one upon another. Number one, naturalistic evolution. I'm not going to take time to explain them tonight, just to tell you what's coming. Number two, cultural Marxism. Number three, deconstructionism. Number four, legal positivism. That's moral relativism applied to the law. Number five, feminism, anti-family, anti-father. Six, sexual liberation. If it feels good, do it. Seven, abortion. Eight, national health care or socialized medicine. Nine, socialism. Ten, weaponized psychology. Eleven, euthanasia. Twelve, Capitalism and patriotism equals oppression and racism. 13, one world spirituality. And 14, globalism. I believe all of these make up the parts of a system that is even being assembled now that when fully assembled is a machine that will kill us as a nation. Our nation will commit suicide. Now, when we talk about some of these things, socialized medicine, globalism, one world spirituality, feminism, we may not think that these individual parts are all that deadly. We don't like them. We don't agree with them. They can do harm, but we don't see them maybe as being deadly. But when they are assembled together as part of our legal system and code and rules and laws, and culture, and way of life, they cause our nation to commit suicide. And I believe the powerful institutions that are being used to carry out this brainwashing operation, this information operation, psychological warfare, fake news, propaganda war, re-education, whatever you want to call it, as I said, are education, and media, and religion, and we'll get into this more in depth in future programs. These are the three powerful institutions for brainwashing though, education, media, and religion. Colossians 2 verse 8 says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. And indeed, today we have many philosophies and ideas that are ruling the day. Another word for philosophies would be lies. Don't be cheated through empty deceit or lies that are according to the tradition of men. There's a lot of things that have been created out of the mind of man today, as we'll see in tonight's program, that are 100% false. But they're passed off because... Uh, as being legitimate because of the people that are promoting them. Oftentimes, the people promoting these things wear lab coats, white coats. They're psychologists. They're doctors. 
Uh, sometimes they're wearing a religious uniform. They're a priest. They're a pastor. They're a rabbi. Sometimes they're wearing a, a, a uniform of a police officer or a sheriff or a sheriff deputy. Sometimes they're wearing a suit and they work for the FBI. But sometimes they're a professor and they're wearing a, a bow tie with glasses and standing in front of a chalkboard. And, and various people have been used to give credibility to that which is really empty deceit, lies, fables, based on the beliefs of man or the tradition of man, but they're 100% false. But they have been marketed and sold to the American people. The American people have been told, don't question these folks. They are the brain trust of our nation. They are the smart ones. They're the leaders. And reality is, what is happening is a brainwashing operation through intimidation. Who are you? Who are you to question these people? Yet Colossians 2 says, 2 verse 8 says, don't be cheated by such men. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 through 5 make it very clear to us as we discussed last week. This is a spiritual battle. It is a battle for the mind. And remember last week we talked about the fact that brainwashing involves the mind, the heart. The heart and the mind is tied to the soul or the spirit, will that, that which will live forever. The Bible uses the word heart and mind interchangeably. The word heart is used over 800, about 826 times in the Bible. This is being done at the spiritual level. And the Bible makes it very clear that the battle for our mind is a spiritual battle. And that's why it clearly states that this is not a carnal issue. This is not that which is of material matter, but it is at the spiritual level. Ephesians 6 makes this clear as well. This is something happening at the spiritual level. Remember last week I told you that the word brainwashing uh, actually is derived by the Chinese as believing it comes from the word heart washing. Heart washing. It was, a, it was a equal to that of witchcraft. So again, we're talking about something that's occurring at a spiritual level that involves the mind and the heart and the soul and the spirit. Well, last week I quickly shared with you what I believe are the various systematic steps for brainwashing. Any speaker who has taken any classes on how to speak publicly knows that one of the things you're to do is to tell people what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And last week, I told you what it is I'm going to teach you. And I went through the 10 steps quickly at the end of last week's broadcast, the 10 steps for what I believe uh, are really the most effective way to carry out brainwashing. Now, again, you can come up with your own outline, your own steps, but having studied this for some time and keeping an outline on what I'm reading, I came up with what I believe are 10 key steps, 10 systematic steps for how you brainwash someone. Number one is as follows. Remove or discredit leaders that are principled, courageous, and people of convictions and morality. Remove or discredit leaders that are principled, courageous, and people of convictions and morality. This is the first step that must be achieved in brainwashing. Of course, we discussed last week that one of the things you have to do is get people to doubt themselves, be involved in self-criticism, to doubt their worldview. But this here is also very important, step one, removing leaders. Now, I told you about the book, Beyond the Call, written by William E. Mayer with, with the U.S. Army, Brainwashing the Ultimate Weapon. It was released on October 4th, 1956. And I mentioned to you that he actually gave a speech the next month, November, November 27th, 1956, the very next month. And in that speech, here's just a little bit of what he said. It helps us to understand this war on men, the war on leaders. He said, quote, Now the weapon they used, speaking of the POWs that was used on the POWs, remember, now we're talking about the uh, communist in the Korean War, and what the communists did to our American POWs during the Korean War. So he's speaking about what the communists did to our POWs, the American POWs, during the Korean War. Quote, Now the weapon they used was deceptively simple. Before they could put it into effect, 
they had to segregate leaders, which they did very simply by putting them into what was reactionary camps. They put into reactionary camps reactionaries, people who tried to be leaders, people who showed what the communists called poisonous individuals. If you had the temerity to try to organize anything, off you went to the reactionary camp. You were obviously hopeless. Other reactionaries were people with a higher education who were considered automatically pretty reactionary unless they volunteered to cooperate, and some did. Other reactionaries were overtly religious people. The communists also felt that they couldn't do much with them. They segregated all these people in reactionary camps. And you know what percentage of the total group this was? Five. When they had taken 5% of the people away, there were no leaders left. My friends, that is a very startling part of this report to me. 5%. What if that number that our U.S. military came up with after studying the prisoners of war during the Korean War, what if that number held true in our society? What if you could remove 5% of the leaders from your church? Could it be taken over? What if you could remove 5% of the leaders from your local city government? Could your city government be taken to progressive socialist ideals? What if 5% of our strong leaders could be removed from our state houses? Would our state houses be taken over by socialist progressive ideas? What if the 5% of our strongest leaders were removed from our Senate in Washington, D.C. and the House of Representatives? Would our nation cave? If this number holds true and you only need to remove or discredit or silence 5% of America's leaders to have success, then my friends, this should be a real warning to how vitally important it is to be a leader. It also should show us that it doesn't take a very large percentage of people to be leaders of conviction and courage to make a difference. My friend and former Muslim Sharam Hadian has repeatedly told me that the Islamists here in America, the Muslim Brotherhood, which dates all the way back to 1928, founded by Albana, they were involved in the Holocaust. They worked with Adolf Hitler to carry out the final solution in the slaughter of five, uh, six million Jews, five million non-Jews. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Grand Mufti of Palestine, Al Husseini, Muslim Brotherhood leader, they worked with Hitler. This is the Muslim Brotherhood in their vile, vile uh, worldview. And they're here in America today. And they've openly stated their desire to take over America. And that's what my entire docu-movie, Sabotage, is all about. Because in their document, the Muslim explanatory, they openly state they will get Americans to sabotage our own country. They openly stated they will get Americans to sabotage their own miserable house with their own hands. And indeed, we've done that largely by making sure that those who are strong, courageous leaders of conviction are marginalized and characterized and pushed aside, eliminated, defeated. And Muslim Brotherhood, as my friend Sharam Hadid has told me over and over, have written that they really only need to control about 8% of the population of any community to begin to really run the table. So whether we're talking about removing leaders from a POW camp, 5%, as William E. Mayer said, the communists had to move aside. They had to remove aside 5% of the men. 5% had to be removed from the other 95%. Otherwise, those 5% of POWs who are leaders would infect the other 95 or the Muslim Brotherhood who says they can begin to massively control a community if the Islamists just make up 8% of the population. What's the point I'm making? There seems to be some, some rather strong evidence that it only takes a small 
little group of people who know what they believe, why they believe it, and stand for it to make drastic change within an institution or within a culture or society. 5% were moved aside in the POW camp so they would not infect others. Well, today, it's no secret that there is a war on men. There's a war on leaders. Do you remember back in 2009 when the report by the Department, Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration released this report? Right-wing extremism, subtitled Current Economic and Political Climate Fueling Resurgence in Radicalization and Recruitment. Well, I went through a little bit of it today in preparations for tonight's broadcast and look at what their report openly stated. A failed economy was helping to improve uh, and recruit more extremists, they said. Anti-government conspiracy theories and, quote, end times, end quote, prophecies could motivate extremist individuals and groups to stockpile food, ammunition, and weapons. In other words, people who are, who are interested in Bible prophecy or understand Bible prophecy or are concerned about the events of the Bible coming to pass, well, they might be prone to saying, well, maybe we better do something about that and be prepared. And so if you tonight are someone that has stockpiled some extra food, even though, of course, the uh, Department of Homeland Security actually has for years encouraged people to do that, but I guess if you do that, that then makes you an extremist. But if you're someone who has stockpiled some extra food, maybe purchased some extra guns and ammunition, then you're an extremist. You're a potential terrorist, the document said. But it also went on to say this, right-wing extremists were concerned during the 1990s with the perception that illegal immigrants were taking away American jobs through willingness to work at significantly lower wages. They also opposed free trade agreements, arguing that these arrangements resulted in Americans losing jobs to countries such as Mexico. So again, what makes you a potential extremist? If you are interested in legal immigration, you're not interested in open borders or George Soros's open society. If you're concerned that illegal immigrants taking money under the table, not paying taxes, not paying workers compensation uh, and other things that the entrepreneur in America pays. If you're concerned that they're working on a cash basis and not complying with the law gives them an uneven uh, advantage over the entrepreneur in America. Well, you might be an extremist. You might be a potential terrorist. If you're concerned about uh, international agreements like NAFTA taking jobs from America, you might be an extremist. What else made you an extremist? Well, the report goes on to say many right-wing extremist groups perceive recent gun control legislation as a threat to their right to bear arms and in response have increased weapons and ammunition stockpiling as well as renewed participation in paramilitary training exercises. Historically, domestic right-wing extremists have feared, predicted, and anticipated a cataclysmic economic collapse in the United States. So again, if you're concerned about uh, the uh, national security situation in America and you have put away some guns and ammunition to be able to defend yourself per the Second Amendment, or if you believe that our debt is unsustainable and there might be an economic collapse, well, that makes you a potential economic, uh, excuse me, a potential terrorist and and extremists. The document went on to say the possible passage of new restrictions on firearms and the return of military veterans facing significant challenges reintegrating into the, their communities could lead to the potential emergence of terrorist groups or lone wolf extremists capable of carrying out violent attacks. So again, this Department of Homeland Security document goes on to bemoan people that are concerned about national security, our borders, uh, uh, veterans, who are coming home from war, people who are concerned about our economic condition, if you're pro-life, if you're uh, interested in uh, Bible prophecy or end time scenarios, all of the, these things could make you, make you an extremist, a potential terrorist. And yet, my friends, what's going on here is really nothing more than conditioning the American people, softening up the American people to be afraid of, to be leery, to be ready to turn in rugged individualists who do not want to be dependent on the government in a crisis, so they put away some food, who don't want to be subject to the roving gangs of thugs who might show up at their house to take what they have so they arm themselves, per the Second Amendment, or maybe they're concerned about an unlawful, unconstitutional government thwarting its, uh, thwarting its responsibilities and exceeding its responsibilities. So again, they 
honor the rule of law and honor the Constitution and understand that an armed populist is how you maintain freedom. If you are involved in any of these activities, you're an extremist, according to the Department of Home Homeland Security back in 2009. And what's really going on? Anyone who is a constitutionalist with strong convictions and an individualist is going to be painted as just that, a threat, an extremist, a potential terrorist. And the war on such Americans continues from 2009 to today, 2019. Look at this headline from Fox News, January 9th, 2019. Traditional masculinity deemed harmful could lead to sexual harassment, medical group says. Now, we've talked a lot about this, but in just a minute, what I'm going to show you is that these news stories that I'm sharing with you did not occur in a vacuum. They didn't just all of a sudden start appearing in the newspaper. There has been a systematic campaign going on for many generations to set up to marginalize, to characterize conservative patriots, Christians, people of faith, men of valor, men of honor, people that have the courage of their convictions, people who believe in the rule of law and our form of government and our constitutional republic. There has been a systematic campaign to set them up as the problem, as the problem. And it goes all the way back to a book, in part, written in 1950 called The Authoritarian Personality, written by a few of the guys from the Frankfurt School. Now, we have talked about the Frankfurt School for many years. At our Worldview Weekends, we began to talk about the Frankfurt School in the mid-1990s. That's how long we've been talking about cultural Marxism. Over 25 years at this point. And the Frankfurt School that came here to America from Germany originally was the school or institute of Marxism. Marxism. Many of them, of being of Jewish descent, decided when Hitler came to power in 33, it was time to leave. They came to America after that point in time and were dropped down at Brandeis and Berkeley and Princeton and said, we're going to change America from within by going after education and media, as we have discussed on many, many broadcasts and in many of my books. And a few of those men wrote a book that came out in 1950 called The Authoritarian Personality. And tonight, you're going to learn about that book. And you're going to learn that all the attacks on the American male, masculinity, uh, hiding under things like white privilege, feminism, the attacks of those who have supported the policies of Donald Trump did not occur in a vacuum. They didn't just all of a sudden appear with the election of Donald Trump. This has been in the bloodstream of our media and educational system for many generations. Thanks in part to some of the faculty from the Frankfurt School, open cultural Marxist, who openly stated that if they were to carry out a Marxist revolution in America, they must destroy the American male. They must destroy strong, courageous men of conviction who are leaders. They must move a percentage of the leaders off to the sidelines or their revolution in brainwashing the American people will not be successful. Remember, the Frankfurt School guys openly stated that their revolution did not involve guns and bullets, but it was a new way of revolution, a diffused and dispersed disintegration of the system. It was a long march through the institutions. It was to attack the existing morality of every institution that makes America great. From our families, to our churches, to our schools, to our culture and way of life, arts and entertainment, Every area of life, every institution, and the morality that it exhibited was to be attacked and thwarted and overthrown. And they saw as the obstacle to this men of courage and conviction that would not tolerate such immorality within their own homes or their own nation, their own community. And so those men had to be marginalized, characterized, and destroyed. Thus, 
the authoritarian personality book was published in 1950. So what I'm about to share with you before we get into that book is that these news stories such as this one so many people have talked about from the American Psychological Association declaring that masculinity or toxic masculinity or uh, ideological masculinity is potentially a psychological disorder is not new at all because the men from the Frankfurt School were known for combining the ideas of Karl Marx with that of Sigmund Freud. So they were known for weaponizing psychiatry to paint as crazy those who were their opposition, largely conservative people of faith and capitalist. So this did not happen overnight and it isn't happening by chance. It is the long march through the institutions as the, as the Frankfurt School called for. We'll get to that in just a minute. But again, look at this article, Fox News, January 9th, 2019. The article stated, for the first time in its history, the American Psychological Association released guidelines concerning men and boys saying that so-called, quote, traditional masculinity, end quote, not only is, quote, harmful, end quote, but also could lead to homophobia and sexual harassment. In quote. Let me just stop right there. Homophobia. Why is it called a phobia? It's an unreasonable fear. You notice they use these words all the time. Homophobia, Islamophobia, xenophobia. You, you, you have some kind of fear of immigrants. Everything's got phobia on the end of it. And they categorize you that way on purpose to paint you as being psychologically unbalanced and extremist, dangerous a threat to society. You have an unreasonable fear or phobia. And so the American Psychological Association going along with pervert uh, Sigmund Freud, and don't forget Sigmund Freud, as I write about in my book, Grave Influence, and we just finished up our whole series on grave influence, but he was one of the 21 radicals ruling America from the grave that I write about in the book, Grave Influence. And Sigmund Freud openly taught, if you remember from our past class, that the only truly sane individuals were those who had not rejected their natural inclinations to lust of killing, cannibalism, and incest. Those were the sane people. Jeffrey Dahmer, he was normal and sane, according to Freud. Ted Bundy, normal and sane, according to Sigmund Freud. Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, normal and sane, just living out their natural inclinations. They're, they're, no hey, they're normal people. The crazy ones, said Freud, are the Christians, the conservatives, the people of faith who have suppressed their natural inclinations to the lust of killing, cannibalism, and incest and have gone crazy. And so the American Psychological Association, obviously going along with pervert Sigmund Freud, puts out a, a document, here it is, these guidelines on masculinity, declaring that if you teach your child to be masculine, your boys, your sons, your grandsons, your nephews, to be masculine men, you could be psychologically harming them and making them mentally unstable. Again, folks, this is right out of the 1950 book from the Frankfurt School, Authoritarian Personality. The article in Fox News article on their website goes on to say, the main thrust of the subsequent research is that traditional masculinity marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression is on the whole harmful, says the new press release. Now, look at that. If you're into competitiveness, if you're being competitive as an athlete or as a, as a student even, if you have dominance, what if you're being dominant on the football field or dominant in your, your field of work? What if you're being a, too aggressive to succeed? These are all bad things. Notice, by the way, people that are competitive and dominate their area of expertise or their sport or their occupation or their field of expertise or people who are aggressive in being successful, these are the things that make great entrepreneurs. These are the things that make great leaders. Yes, you could take any of these words and make them into a negative, but you can also take the words competitive and dominant and aggressive and make them positive. Oh, he was, he dominated the court. That a sportscaster might say of a basketball player. He dominated the court tonight. Or a, or a, a broadcaster may say of a, um, of a football player, he was aggressive on the line. At every snap, he was aggressive. These are characteristics that are valued 
in those fields of sports. And they could be the same in the area of capitalism. He's an aggressive entrepreneur. But you see, we're taking things and, and ideas that we often use within sports to inculcate characteristics into young men to make them successful businessmen, to make them successful military leaders, to make them successful titans of corporations. And we often try to incorporate those ideas of competitiveness and aggressive dominance in positive ways and channel that energy into a positive way on the field, whether it's football or basketball or baseball. And we say, now you can take these same traits and you can apply yourself in life and be successful. But see, we're destroying these things where we're making it bad to succeed, bad to be a winner, bad to be better than anyone else. Socialism doesn't work when people are better than others. And so everyone must be the same. There must be a dumbing down. There must be a punishment of individuality. There must be a rewarding for weakness and group consensus. There must be a rewarding for those who join the common denominator. So notice again the very things that we as a society and nation have upheld and, and desire to inculcate into our young men, even on the sports uh, basketball court or the football field, and then to incorporate them into life are now thought to be ways that are leading to them being psychologically imbalanced. The article went on to say, that the American Psychological Association in its report notes that research shows, quote, traditional masculinity is psychologically harmful and that socializing boys to suppress their emotions causes damage that echoes both inwardly and outwardly, end quote. In other words, uh, don't teach boys to be masculine and to suppress their emotions. Ultimately, their goal is the destruction of the American male. Because they knew if they were to have a revolution, they must not have men of courage and conviction, strong leaders. They must move them out of the way. And so you feminized your, your men so they are not leaders, so they won't stand up. So they cannot handle the, the uh, battlefield, or they can't handle being a prisoner of war. They can't handle the tough things. And they certainly could not handle a revolution going on within their co country. They would give up, roll over, comply go along. And so we see that raising strong leaders is now a psychological disorder. Fox News article goes on to say traditional masculinity ideology has been shown to limit, limit male psychological development, constrain their behavior, result in gender role strain and gender role conflict, and negatively influence mental health and physical health, the report warns. Well, here's that book from 1950. The Authoritarian Personality. And what you're about to hear, folks, is right out of, what we just heard is really coming right out of this book. All of this talk of white privilege, racism, toxic masculinity, all of this comes right out of the Frankfurt School and their war on the American male and particularly male leaders. The Authoritarian Personality. This is from my book, Grave Influence. Here's what I wrote in my book in 2008, In Grave Influence. Dr. Gerald L. Atkinson, commander, United States Navy retired, describes the attack on the American male through the propaganda of the Frankfurt School. What's another word for propaganda? Propaganda war, brainwashing, information operation, re-education, right? So this is a retired commander in the United States Navy who is writing about what the Frankfurt School was up to. Here's what he writes, quote, the Frankfurt School studied the authoritarian personality, which became synonymous with the male, the patriarchal head of the American family. A modern utopia would be constructed by these idealistic intellectuals by turning Western civilization upside down. The utopia would be a product of their imagination, a product not susceptible to criticism on the basis of the examination of evidence. This revolution would be accomplished by fomenting a very quiet, subtle, and slowly spreading cultural Marxism, which would apply to culture, the principles of Karl Marx, bolstered by the modern psychological tools of Sigmund Freud. Thus, cultural Marxism became a marriage of Marx and Freud aimed at producing a quiet revolution in the United States of America. 
This quiet revolution has occurred in America over the last or the past 30 years. And he wrote this several years ago. While America slept, the authoritarian personality studied by the Frankfurt School in the 1940s and 1950s in America prepared the way for the subsequent warfare against the masculine gender promoted by Herbert Marcuse and his band of social revolutionaries under the guise of women's liberation and the new left movement in the 1960s. The evidence that psychological techniques for changing personality is intended to mean emasculation of the American male is provided by Abraham Maslow, founder of Third Force Humanist Psychology and promoter of the psychotherapeutic classroom, who wrote that, quote, the next step in personal evolution is a transcendence of both masculinity and femininity to general humanness, end quote. The Marxist, revolutions knew, the Marxist revolutionaries knew exactly what they wanted to do and how to do it. They have succeeded in accomplishing much of their agenda, end quote. Notice that Abraham Maslow and the Frankfurt School wanted to do away with masculinity and femininity. Thus, we have seen the feminization of the American male and radical feminism that is anti-family, anti-father, and many of your leading feminists like Betty Friedan and others were outright Marxist. Many of them encouraging young girls to be lesbians while they were young, then get married to have children, and after having children raising them, going back to being lesbian. This is about the destruction of the American male, the American family, marriage, the incubator as the founding fathers understood the family to be for passing on a constitutional republic. But these people hate the constitutional republic. They hate our way of life and they want a revolution, a cultural revolution. And once they've changed the attitudes and values of the American people and created the chaos that has certainly resulted, then the American people will cry out for the socialism and big government that they need to solve the chaos that has been created through the culture war. Here's an article, authoritarian personality from Psych Psychologist World, Authoritarian Personality, subtitled How Theodore Ardorno's F-Scale Aimed to Identify Fascism and Authoritarian Personality. The article said, look at the authoritarian personality. How much do you agree with the following statements? People can be divided into two distinct classes, the weak and the strong. Some people are born with the urge to jump from high places. No weakness or difficulty can hold us back if we have enough willpower. Most of our social problems would be solved if we could somehow get rid of the immoral, crooked, and feeble-minded people. These statements you just read are part of one of the most infamous psychological scales of the 20th century. Theodore Ardorno's F scale. The F stood for fascist. And the test was meant to help identify how racism develops in people. My friends, what you need to understand is these Marxist Jews who came from Germany when Hitler came to power and came to America, they were Marxist. They opposed Hitler's socialist system, his National Socialist Workers' Party, socialism, his fascism, because they were Marxist. The communist and the socialist fight all the time. The communist and the, and the fascist fight all the time because they want their brand. And so these guys were outright Marxist. They didn't like Hitler's socialist state. They were Marxist. And Hitler didn't like the socialist, or I mean the, the communist. Although he added red to his flag, it is said, the Nazi flags are trying to appeal to them. And many of the people wearing the black Antifa communist outfits during Hitler's day literally took off those uniforms and put on the brown shirts and joined him when it was obvious he was going to be the leader. But this is a common struggle that goes on between socialist and communist, or socialist and Marxist, or fascist and Marxist. So the Frankfurt School guys didn't like this socialism, fascism. They liked Marxism. But they wanted to know, how is it that a people accepted the rise to power like someone as Adolf Hitler? And so they made up this test, the F-scale test, and the F stood for fascist. And my friends, what is happening today is those who are following anyone who has certain strong ideas or beliefs like national security, build a border wall, have a national culture, have American way of life, a strong economy, no to socialism, yes to capitalism, cut the size of government, unleash the entrepreneurial spirit, vet those coming to America from Islamic nations, vet them, defund Planned Parenthood. 
defund parts of the United Nations like the UNESCO, if you go against these liberal progressive ideas that are dear to their heart, then they will categorize you as a fascist. So now we have people who are for Donald Trump's policies, maybe not for him as a person per se, or some of his baggage, but they like his policies, many of them, you're deemed a fascist. You wear the red MAGA hat, make America great, you're a fascist or you're a Nazi. And they're saying that you are following a strong type A authoritarian personality like Donald Trump. And why is it you'll follow a guy like that? Because in your heart, you're really a fascist. And so they give you a test. And reality is anyone that believes in right and wrong, convictions, hard work, ideas have consequences, you would fail their test. Read, go read the F scale test. You'd fail it if you believe in absolute truth, right and wrong. Ideas have consequences. Your worldview matters. People should suffer the consequences for their behavior. Good, good uh, <coughs> character should be rewarded. Hard work should be rewarded. Laziness should be punished. Strong convictions should be just that. Strong convictions that you stand for and you don't compromise. You're not interested in, in uh, the group consensus. You're going to stick with your convictions. All of that would make you the authoritarian personality and you would fail the F-scale test and thus you're a fascist. Sound familiar? You see, what's happening in America today didn't just happen with the election of Donald Trump. It has been a long march through the institutions and a war on strong male leaders. The authoritarian personality. The article in the Psycholo Psychologist World goes on to say, the authoritarian personality type. According to Ardarno's theory, the elements of the authoritarian personality type are blind allegiance to conventional beliefs about right and wrong, respect for submission to acknowledged authority, belief in aggression toward those who do not subscribe to conventional thinking or who are different, a negative view of people in general, i.e. the belief that people would all lie, cheat, and, or steal if given the opportunity, a need for strong leadership, which displays uncompromising power, a belief in simple answers and polemics, i.e. the media controls us all or the source of our, all our problems is the loss of mor morals these days, resistance to creative, dangerous ideas, a black and white worldview, a tendency to project one's own feelings of inadequacy, rage, and fear onto a scapegoated group, a preoccupation with violence and sex. Now, we don't have time to go through every one of these, but you can see what they're trying to do. You can see exactly what they're trying to do and how it fits with today. They're trying to make people who have strong convictions, morals, who are hardworking, maybe type A, they're aggressive, they don't give up, as bad people, achievers, people of conviction, people of morals, as bad people. People who don't find themselves being tolerant of that which is wrong, immoral, unethical opposed to our constitutional republic. You don't have tolerance for that. You're not going to be open-minded about these things. You see how they're painting you? To measure these things in, in, in subjects, Ardorno devised a test that asked them to state how they agreed with particular statements or how much they agree with particular statements. Each statement was correlated to one of the above uh, elements. For example, question. The businessman and the, and the manufacturer are more important to our country than artists and writers. Question, every person should have complete faith in a supernatural being whose decisions he obeys without question. Question, an insult to our honor should always be punished. See, my friends, again, what are they doing? Anyone who has a belief in God, in the divine, is psychologically imbalanced. They're the authoritarian personality. They're a Nazi. They're a fascist. Maybe not outright but they could be prone to following a leader that was a fascist or a Nazi. That's what they're stating. In my research here, I found this website, a socialist, feminist, anti-racist organization, Solidarity. And they wrote an article about Ardernos, the authoritarian personality. They said, quote, the book is most remembered for its development of an F scale, a quantifiable measure of an individual's susceptibility to fascism, gleaned from survey questions and interviews. According to Ardorno, if you strongly agree with the following statements, you might not be a fascist right now, but you would be the kind of person who probably fall for a fascist demagogue when one came calling. Such questions as, there is too much emphasis in college on intellectual and the uh, th theoretical topics, not enough emphasis on practical matters and on the homely virtues of living. Homosexuality is a particularly rotten form of delinquency and ought to be severely punished. Human nature being what it is, there will always be war and conflict. There are some things too intimate or personal to talk about even with one's closest friends. 
There are some activities so flagrantly un-American that when responsible officials won't take the proper steps, the wide awake citizen should take the law into his own hands. Let me just stop right there. That's why we have a Second Amendment. If the government gets outside the confounds of a constitutional republic, the Second Amendment is there for the American people to replace that unlawful government with a constitutional government. So again, they're, they're putting the question in a way that makes it sound like people could be vigilantes, when in fact they might actually be overthrowing a Marxist government, a deep state, a fifth column, to replace it with the lawful constitutional republic once again. But you see how these questions are geared to make people who hold to right and wrong faith and family, convictions and values as evil, dangerous, mentally unhinged. Some of the questions also included, no insult to our honor should ever go unpunished. Every person should have a deep faith in some supernatural force higher than themselves to which he gives total allegiance and whose decisions he does not question. Too many people today are living in an unnatural, soft way. We should return to the fundamentals to be a more red-blooded, active way of life. So again, if you believed in these things, you're a bad person, you're a part of the authoritarian personality, you're prone to following a Nazi or a fascist. Then here's Politico, January 17, 2016. The one weird trait that predicts whether you're a Trump supporter. And you know what it was? The one thing is his authoritarianism, his, his beliefs, what he stood for. If you follow him, then you could be part of that authoritarian personality. So let me conclude by stating this. Next week, we're going to return to some quotes right out of the report by William E. Mayer. And we're going to look at how they were able to get the American male to not be a leader, to move those 5% out of the way, take those 95% and without the influence of strong male leaders, authoritarian figures, they could then take them and begin to brainwash them. And my friends, I want you to understand as we conclude tonight, what is happening in America with the assault on the American male, masculinity, strong leaders, is not something that just occurred in the last few years. It has been a systematic process of brainwashing, information operation, manipulation, re-education, to paint as bad, those who are strong, moral leaders and patriots. And my friends, it's only going to get worse. And remember, apparently all it takes is to marginalize or characterize about 5% of our strong men, our strong leaders, folks of courage and conviction, and the other 95% can be easily taken downstream with the cultural Marxism. My friends, I hope you appreciate what we're doing here. It takes hours to study, to read, to prepare, to be ready, and not to mention the great expense of streaming this. I can't say it uh, seriously enough. We need to hear from you. I think I told you a couple weeks ago, we signed a contract for $24,000 just for the streaming service so that all of our shows, you can watch at WVWTV or at worldviewradio.com. Not to mention, we then have to have a contract with live stream to stream this to you at night on Sunday nights. All of this costs money, and most of what we do, we do make available for free, at least for a period of time before it rolls into our VIP club. It's vital we hear from you with your tax-deductible contribution at wvwfoundation.com. wvwfoundation.com. There you'll also find our mailing address if you prefer to send a check. So please, don't delay. We need to hear from you today. It's vitally important you partner with us if you want this broadcast outlet to continue and us producing the kind of content you've come to appreciate and expect. Now, next Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll pick it up with our live broadcast, Brainwashed America, part three, as we continue to look at, well, how the communist revolution of, the, of uh, China in 1949 and the brainwashing of our POWs in the Korean War can be used to see what's happening to us here in America through the powerful institutions of education media, and religion. Thank you for watching. Till next week, I'm Brandon House. Take care.